I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom, a meeting of our Language of Wisdom study group led by Jerry Northrup. And today uh, we'll be talking about the ABCs of wondrous wisdom, which are the twosome, threesome, foursome. And so, Jerry, uh, welcome uh, to Kirby, Daniel, Jerry, and Jerry, please, uh, your introductory remarks. Okay. Um, I've been really digging into math for wisdom to try and, and understand the foundational basis. And I've gone through Andreas's history, uh, his, um, his compilation of the truth and, and what have you. And my understanding is that he, he saw these uh, concepts, the twosome, threesome, foursome, uh, when he was still in high school. Uh, 17 or something like that. Uh, I was that... just freshman in a college. I was just entering the college. Ah, so you were just... Uh... Yeah. It was my collision with the University of Chicago with this other world ah. who did not believe in absolute truth. That's where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> so, ah. Okay. Very... And, and then the uh, the... Eightfold cycle, the divisions of everything that came after college, or did that come through your junior year in college? When no, that came in. Uh, so I, um, in when I, um, I got my bachelor's degrees uh, from the University of Chicago in 1986. Then I went for my PhD in math at the University of California at San Diego. After uh, my first two years. Uh, I got. Uh, I took a year off to study in Soviet-occupied Lithuania at the uh, Vilnius University that, as an independent were, scholar, was and I was able to work school. on my own philosophy. So I was just on my own, um, and so then I was like maybe that was uh, 1988, 1989. It was a very exciting time. It was the year before the Berlin Wall fell, so there was this huge uh, Gorbachev era uh, perestroika movement, but it was really an independence movement, and so. Um, I was in the thick of that. Um, there were like five uh, foreigners in the whole country. <laughs> and so I was one of them uh, during that winter time. And then it was exciting. But so during that time, I was focused on my philosophy. And uh, I was reading Kant's critique of pure reason, among other things. That was what my advisor uh, suggested. And um, then I, um, at, at a certain point, I realized, oh, if you think of this as an eight cycle, and you think of you know, adding like a perspective or two perspectives or three, perspectives, then everything makes sense. It all adds up together. So I must have been like uh, 24 or so. So that was that was while you were in graduate school that you spent the year right. in Lithuania. Yeah, I took a break. Uh, okay. um, I thought that was a uh, freshman or, the, or that was when you were an undergraduate. So, okay. So my, my understanding was that the development of the Tutham twosome, threesome, foursome uh, was not heavily influenced by what you'd learned so far in mathematics or physics, but it, it came mostly out of your prior experience and your your um, interaction with religion and, and uh, how you were trying to cope with the theory of everything and, and that sort of stuff. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, I studied... Uh... I got a general education. So when I entered college, I said, well, I will study uh, physics as an example of a successful empirical science. I will study math as uh, the study of structure, which is necessary for making a new science, you know, to expressing it mathematically. And I will study humanities and social sciences. So every quarter, I basically like took one course in right. um, to get a general education. But uh, also, because I was well advanced in mathematics, just independently studying uh, when I came to, uh, I'd already done two years of calculus, so on my own, basically. So um, uh, I passed I passed out of the honors calculus, I didn't have to take that. So uh, I was able to get a degree in physics, degree in math, just taking one course at a time. But then okay. I thought like, okay, well, what do I educate myself further? I just thought math is the hardest thing to study on your own. So I thought right. like most things you can study on your own, but I thought I should study math. So okay. that's the reason. But it never, 
it, it and with the hope I actually wrote my PhD thesis with the hope of trying to find these types of structures in math, but not especially. Uh, uh, well, I didn't make any breakthrough, I guess, in that regard. And so this is all pre-mathematical type of thinking. But in uh, 2016, I returned to math. I thought, well, that'd be a nice application if I could explain how all of math unfolds. And then I started to notice, oh, these structures do appear. I, in 2016, I learned about bot periodicity. I go, oh, that's an interesting coincidence. And so then Math for Wisdom, I found it two years ago. I thought I'd really focus on that. But really, okay. maybe just to emphasize, like the kind of things we've been doing in recent weeks, where you and Kirby, like have you know, and John have really made efforts to play around with these structures. That's the essential thing uh, for them to be real. You know, it's like everything else is just a way to get people to that point where we are. Okay, that that's that's very helpful. So there was a, a reasonable mathematical sophistication. Mm -hmm before you actually formalize the twosome, threesome, foursome? I can, um, so I'll be able to, today, uh, I don't want to overrun your remarks, but I'll be able to explain like how that arose in my thinking and, and explain. Okay. Yeah. That that would be very helpful for me. And uh, what I've, I've come to feel is that the twosome, threesome, foursome uh, were not just symbolic, representations of foundational ideas, but they were much more complicated sorts of, of structures. So like in the twosome, um, I begin to think that you see the twosome as a process or as a, an operation, a vector, a perspective, all of those things kind of um, are still represented by the twosome. Is that correct? Well, I'll be able to explain, you know, what the... Uh... What okay. I mean. mm -hmm. And that that goes, I, I played around a little bit with your symbolic structure. So if I could do a screen share. Uh, Tucson, okay, super. But anyway, this, this is your diagram or right out of your stuff for Tucson. And so what I did was play around with this a little bit and say, okay, <clears throat> here's your Tucson, but here are other ways of representing it. Uh, the twosome is a relation, and then you've got the the arrows and different kinds of representation of the arrows. And as soon as you put an arrow in, that implies a movement or time or something, a direction. It's more than just a relation. And so my question was, is, are these equivalent representations of your concept of twosome? No. So those would all be invalid they would all be fictional they would all be non-existent you know? they're all different so, they're just so don't they just don't i mean on the fundamental level they're just wrong basically like the twosome okay. is an arrow that's <clears throat> the point i mean so the third but one is there is any correct. is there any arrow for example how does practice influence theory no you see i think like um what this is um um, well, how can I, I, I guess like the, the, the answer is it doesn't <laughs> like the answer is like, it kind of like maybe start with free will and faith is a simple, like you could think you have free will, but all of a sudden it's like, no, there was no free will. It's all fate. It's a little bit like Kirby with his eraser. He says, yeah, you think that, you know, there's good and bad. I'm just going to erase that distinction and it's gone. And the problem is, is that there's no way to get it back. You know, once you think, oh, I'm a robot, you know. It's all predicted. It's all determined. And once you have this idea of determinism, that it's all determined, right? Like there's no way of climbing out. So there's two modes. There's a way to shift, an easy way to shift from one to the other. In order to shift back, you'd have to be just completely, you know, reset, so to speak. But you wouldn't experience that reset. All you can experience, this is a map of what we can experience. We can experience being in free will and we can experience being fate. We can experience shifting that, so to speak. Um, but um, not the other way around. So with theory and practice, it's kind of like um, off and on. So when you have theory, it's like you have a machine and that machine is off, but you can kind of imagine it being on, but it's off, let's say. So there's these opposites, off and on in theory. But once you turn the machine on, it's like you're going through the machine. You're experiencing the machine. It's like you're the carrot going through the mill. 
you're complementing the machine, you know, as you go through it, you're a one with the machine, you know, as it's complement. And that's practice, that's experience. And there's no going back. You see, you've, so the very important thing, and this has come up in Kirby's letters, etc. like when we think about theory and practice, these are just labels for experience. They're not um, things to think about. Maybe that's what I'm trying to say. See, we're used to seeing a diagram. We're used to saying, oh, these are things I think about. And I'm just removed. No, you see, that's not what this is all about. This is about saying, I have a reality. My reality is very limited. My mind goes from theory to practice. And so a good example, well, this is a metaphor, but in the ant colony, there's this vector of purity, you see. So the queen, the nurses, they live in this level of theory, you know, like they don't know really, the, they've never experienced in the world, they're six feet underground, right? It's in a sterile environment, right? But there's this vector of purity where like you go out and maybe it's more of like a vector of impurity. If you go from nursing, you know, to pick up, clean up trash, take out the trash, you're not allowed back in. You know, if you go out foraging, uh, you know, you're not allowed back, back, you know, in, into the depths. So once you get touch with practice, so to speak, you don't get to go back into the theoretical sterility of the world. It's one way. So how is theory recovered? Uh, there, the experience there must be, of experiencing it. Well, these are just, this is just a way of dividing everything into two parts. Um, this is not existing in the time and space, etc. This is just the way things are, you know, in the in the fundamental level. So we're, we have now that's the idea is that these are just postulates, you know, like this is the fundamentals of the world, you know, and then this is also like how our mind maybe makes a description of a state that there's this state in which these two things matter, let's say, right. And then we get shift, we, we get off on some other topics. So instead of two things, we're thinking of five things, you know, and then, then we come back, we're reset, okay, we're back to two things. And so but and it's not really about thinking one or the other. It's about having both possibilities. But it's just saying that the mind moves. Um, so also we experience these ambiguously. Like so, we experience them as like a set of perspectives, and then we can experience one perspective. We can experience another perspective, so to speak. That's how that's how it's like. So it's just a very different way of looking at things. You know, from the diagram, you can't tell what I'm talking about. But the diagram is notation for like someone who's been through this. It's just a shorthand notation to capture the structure. But it's very important not to be doing the usual thing where you say, oh, this is a picture of what's being talked about. It's okay. more like uh, this is a expression of what was experienced. So that just makes me feel like it's less of a causal articulation or kind of causal association and more like a ski jump or like a catalyst where it's like we slide unidirectionally and then the, the experience right. continues from there, but it's more like a primer cap or like an ignition. What What is what is more like a primer cap or ignition? Like this arrow is representing like an ignition or like it's like a, an a transition in experience from the ambiguity of the twosome into the collapse on the right. And then the, the experiences, other experiences continue that aren't described by this twosome. Well, um, you're adding a lot of, you know, things in there. So I can't accept it all or reject it all. Um, uh, this is, um, how can I say, it's like a layer of reality. And like our mind is typically like busy in one layer. I think that's maybe the say. So like this is the layer, like if the layer is the twosome, that would be the layer where, you know, if you knew that someone's mind is absorbed with the twosome, then you could say, oh, they're dealing with issues of existence. For existence, you need two points of view. You need to be able to say maybe this chair exists or not. Well, that's theoretical, right? But if it exists, then it exists in practice. You know, if it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. A another thing that um, these are kind of like canonical examples of the twosome. The problem uh, in talking about this and thinking about this is that um, um, we you know, we have to dig deep in order to get to this. Like we're, 
we're working, let's say, with examples given by great thinkers, you know, so let's say John mentioned like implicate order, explicate order, right? And you can think like, what are they talking about, right? And et cetera. So you see these different uh, distinctions made. And the question is, um, how do you, what do you do with them? And the idea is that um, if it's a real, like, so something like what's not a division of everything, like good and bad is not a division of everything because there's things that are both good and bad. There's things that are neither good nor bad, you know, and who wants to choose the bad anyways, right? Like, so the whole thing doesn't, um, it doesn't add together as a system, but like free will and fate saying, you know, there's a meaningful choice between good and bad, or there's just nothing to choose from. You see, that's a different type of distinction. That's the one that's relevant. And so like same and different, if two things are the same, they also have to be different. You know, if you could come to, to be able to say that they're the same, they also have to be different. But once they're different, they're just different. So like you have two glasses, they look the same. And then you notice, no, one's dirty, one's clean. You see, so now they're not the same anymore. They're just different, right? Or one's chipped and one's not, right? Or one's, or they're different kinds, let's say, right? They're different kinds of glasses. So the mind, it's, it, it, it thought it was the same. And the same, you know, the double thing takes more energy. It takes less energy just to think, oh, it's all different. Let's see. Or, you know, to practice takes less energy. Theory takes more energy. Like off takes more energy. You know, the notion of off takes more energy than the notion of on. The notion of on is just, you know, it speaks for itself. So, but one of the crucial things is, is like the, the way that reflection distorts things. So notice like deep inside, um, opposites coexist comes before, let's say what I call all is the same. But you see, same comes before different, right? Which is strange because same says it's the same, right? Different says there's opposites, basically, or they're different or whatever. But you have to look at what are we talking about? Same and different are conceivable, so to speak. They're two conceptions, you know, you can have. The actual opposites coexist and all is the same. It's almost like this, it's, it's, it's not even conceivable. It's like this unifying structure that's basically saying structurally there are the same thing is going on with all these four different ways of conceiving that structure. It's the same, but you just can't directly conceive that. There's no way to, because the act of conception is already pushing you out. So one of the things that happens like with these conceiving, like they, they can be reflecting to various degrees. And so same and different, what's basically happened is like you're reflecting upon it, you're removed from it, and it's switching the direction that's common thing to watch out for to happen so it's very important not to be kind of like standing back and seeing that or like you know putting it you get all the wrong answers you really have to be part of the system that's how that's that was the kind of thing i was you know figuring out early on like when i was uh, just entering into freshman college like you know maybe to say like in high school i had uh, been fascinated by things like the Holy Trinity, like this uh, separation of powers, uh, executive, you know, legislative, executive, judicial, like thinking about that type of thing, like what's going on, what's the gist, like what's that, but re recognizing the power of those types of things, the power is that uh, with a structural form, you can um, define content. So there's certain primitive basic content that is given just coming out of the structural form, like it's it's just saying, look, if you have this type of structure, there is a basic way to read that. You see, structure is is defining content. And another thing that was important as I came really into this uh, was to realize, look, if you're struggling with how to define, to know anything, you know, like how can you have up any absolute knowledge about anything? Like, give me an example. Well, or how could you define primitives? You know, if complex things are defined in terms of primitives, but how do you define the primitive things? So uh, the idea is that you define them by their relationships with each other. And so it's the relationships, certain types of relationships are imposing or defining a script, script structure which uh, provides fundamental definitions. Um, and so that's where this is all about, you know, and then trying to understand. It. So it's very difficult to think about because you have to give up the usual way of thinking. Okay, that is um, 
probably very confusing for me at this point. So I'm glad we, we're recording this so that I can mm -hmm. go back and, and really uh, review it again. Let me just, just briefly, while we're on the screen share, go to the next one, mm -hmm. which was a, a preliminary view of the threesome, which I probably have totally wrong as well. So, so you can see this, this is your twosome, threesome, foursome. Right. Everybody can see that. So what I did with the threesome, was just rotated a little bit so that it's like this. So you got to take a stand, follow through, and reflect. Yeah, that's the same, sure. And you can start yeah. from any one. I think John is yeah. up. So yeah. you can start from any one. But to me, reflecting is not just related to taking a stand or to follow through, but also to the interrelationship between the two. So I made a diagram that looked like this, which would... Mm -hmm. In my sense, uh, tie the reflection not only to taking a stand and following through, but to the relationship between them. So what do you think of that? Well, um, in general, I think it's correct and it's true for all three of them. So like one of the ways to think about it. And so like, um, um, you know, that's why I said like, you know, when I interpreted your diagram of the... Um, relational relationship so to speak like so you have like a a relation and you like which like so this take a stand follow through if you think of that as a relation and you have something hooking into that which is a reflecting but basically like i wouldn't draw that line across the center just because i think it's it's uh it would be confusing but just this identification to say the arrow is the same as the node so here you have like three states you have three arrows i'm sorry you have three states or you could call them nodes you have three arrows uh, which represent shifts, but it's possible, uh, I think, to identify a shift with the node on the other side, exactly as you are doing. So to say like uh, reflection, and, and I think maybe just to make it intuitive, like what's going on, the process of switching over from taking a stand to following through is reflection, so to speak, I think. Like I'm taking a stand, but now, you know, uh, I'm getting, you know, I'm, uh, I, I've determined it, I'm starting to put it into plan. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm, you know, specializing it. Maybe I'm starting to do part, small parts of it. Maybe I'm, you know, bringing it all together. Maybe I'm really committing to it. You know, maybe I'm really, you know, in getting it, doing it, whatever. But I think like, um, well, maybe I'm not sure this is right, but instinctively, I guess maybe aesthetically, I do believe like that, 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 that whole, shift can be identified with reflection but see so that's the kind of thing where that's uh something to think about that's something to have a community that can talk about to wonder you know to look for examples to pursue but it's a it's a reasonable idea okay what what i was looking at doing with that is just saying i think this representation in my mind worked for the threesome and if you combine it with the other two possibilities you have something that starts to look like the sixum, but I hadn't gotten into that. So, um, anyway, well, and yes, and yes, and so uh, that is, you know, I know. So the sixum is a more sophisticated, you know, and I'm uh, right. I've made a lot of videos about that. You can see, like, it's still none of this is all set in stone. It's just that certain things are more basic, and so they're less likely to change. But, uh, but very much like what the sixum does, and it's for morality, but it distinguishes between this three cycle understood as a relative, you know, happening relative, and then saying, but there could be absolutely taking a stand, there could be absolutely falling through, it could be absolutely reflecting. So this is more like, um, so this is kind of like godly in the sense, like, you know, to identify with this is like to think like you're God, you know, and that everything is you, right? But with, if you add the, the distinction between absolute and reflective is like, well, maybe half of me is actually just within some relative zone, you know, like, and so that's where I'm learning and that's where I'm proving. Half of me is hooking up with some God's point of view where any one of these could be absolute. They don't need to change. So. Okay, well, let me. Uh, let me stop sharing then. But if you Not go sure. back to the, oh, well, anyways, the crucial thing okay. I wanted to say was like, uh, and something kind of like to do together, like if we collect lots of examples. So uh, uh, I've been thinking about um, Freud's uh, id 
super ego ego you know and you think about something like that say okay like this makes sense to kirby you know it makes sense to freud you know it makes sense to lots of people so how would that fit into this whole wondrous wisdom right but if you collect like a hundred examples or a thousand examples you just start playing with them looking at them so what i would claim is that you'll get like four kinds of two sums and those that i drew there were like the canonical examples i call but so you basically say these are just different words for basically this you know if you if you really but these four are four conceptions of something that we posit that's more fundamental, but we just simply can't access directly because it's just too deep for our conception. But it just, the algebra, just the mechanics of it all just shows like, well, that's what's going on. You know, like there's a, there's a state of mind. When we try to introspect and access it, you have to use a conception, you know? So, so for example, taking a stand, following it through and reflect, typically how we access that, like uh, this difference between being, doing, thinking. See, being, doing, thinking, we access, I think. But the problem with being, doing, thinking is that then you lose the connection between those shifts. You see, you don't really get to see that so clearly. But there's an, the idea is that there's an underlying three cycle, which is essential, you know, and so you, are you, how, how well are you catching that or not? Like, are you seeing this three cycle, being, doing, thinking, like we experiencing it, living it directly, subjectively, analytically, and so, but the other ones are, can be like not so direct, more removed. Like so, necessary, actual, possible is very similar, but it's like totally. Uh, there's no one there. No one's experiencing. It's just form, form, formal. Just like same and different have that same flavor. Why is the threesome experiential or action oriented, like view from the inside, when the others are not? Oh, they're all like that. So, um, well, let's see. The two sums like that. So, like free will and fate, that's experiential. Like, you know, we live that on the inside. But when we say same and different, that's kind of like this uh, necessary, actual, possible. It's like just formal. You see, it's like in a formal system. It does, there's no one inhabiting that necessarily. And so, like uh, Kant talked about uh, four distinctions, and that's so one way to think of those four levels. He distinguished between analytic and synthetic. So the way I would say, like, analytic is a system that kind of is complete unto itself, kind of like logic. Whereas synthetic is something like Hegel would do a lot, like, you know, thesis, antithesis, but you have to synthesize them through something. Something has to join them together, which could be done. Okay, and then there's a distinction uh, Kant would say a posteriori statements, which are based on, you know, experience, let's say, or what what is after the fact, and a priori before the fact, so which are not based on experience. So then you get these four combinations. So like, uh, he'd look at, let's say, something like necessary and actual and possible and things like, or same and different. He'd look at these things and say, well, these are analytic. They're like a logical system, but it's a priori. It's not based on experience. It's just how things are, you know, set up formally but you could have a synthetic statement where you're pulling two things together and then uh it could be um in some, some cases it could be experiential like you're synthesizing it by way of your as you synthesize it you're actually synthesizing raw experience but it could be what you're synthesizing is the formal system so i think like his look at the law of cause and effect he said, that's something that we're gluing together, but it's we're gluing together formally. You see, like logically, we're gluing it together. So, so you can have, the, and that was maybe his rebuttal to Hume. He was saying, cause and effect is something that we glue together and in accord with the way that we're gluing together our experience and it matches up and that's the validity of like we're, we're imposing. But what Kant said, he said, but what we do not have are a posteriori analytic statements. You see, you don't have like these systemic, formal worlds that you know by experience. And I'm saying that's incorrect. And it's incorrect because uh, it's for the incorrect for the same reasons that, you know, he rejected Descartes. He said, you know, I think therefore I am. That's just, um, I, I don't know why he rejected it, but basically he rejected it. But I say, look, that is the analytic apostory statement. The idea that, look, if thinking is relevant I mean, sorry, if thinking is not encompassable, so I, I understand thinking, I live thinking, I experience thinking, if you can't encompass that, then you can't encompass uh, the, the, the thinker, you can't encompass being. So, and significance basically means 
you know, unencompassable. You can't encompass. So if thinking is significant, then being is significant. If being is significant, then doing is significant. If doing is significant, then thinking is significant. There's this three cycle. That's all. We know that because we've experienced that. Like, that's what we know from experience. But it's an analytic system. It's this three cycle. It's just a completely, like, you know, logical world that we live in. So it's extremely important. Uh, it's really the heart of all of human life is this kind of engine and this motor. And so that's how you define being, doing, thinking. So, but it's actually, these are just four ways of grappling, you know, of the mind grappling with a structure that has, let's say, three values, let's say, right? But the point is, is that these are all conceptions of a deeper structure we simply cannot uh, directly access. We access them through these conceptions. That's why, that's how it works. You know, you have to choose one. But mathematically, kind of like mentally, you know, like we could say, oh, well, mechanically, it suggests that, that theoretically there's something to postulate. There's a deeper structure. It's, it's kind of easy, though, to imagine somebody telling me that in their view, doing and thinking, there's no difference there. I mean, thinking is just doing things with words or without words or, you know, writing things, whatever it is, thinking, holding and trying to think. That's all doing. And then how can you be, if there's no sense of being, like the passage of time, a second ago is different from now. Like if there's no d change, there's no being. And so changes do. So be, do, think, there is no difference. It's all one thing. I can imagine someone saying that. And I would just say, yeah, but it's useful to tease them apart because in complicated life, we can't afford to have everything collapse and mean the same thing. But I know what you're saying. I could say that. So well, well, I think so. This is like this is the situation I was in freshman, sophomore, you know, talking to philosophy majors, because they would always say that, you know, whatever you said, they would always say it doesn't have to be that way, you know. But so then the the trick would be like to say. Uh, you know, and so a simple example would be like they deny the concept of everything. There doesn't have to be a concept. And I go, look, when you take a stand, you're appealing to everything. You see, you know what you're talking about. Like, you know, that's the whole point of you. You know, you saying that there can't be. It's basically you're using the scope of everything. So you show through their actions that you know, in reality, pragmatically, they're using these concepts. So, for example, to say to the person who doesn't make those decisions, say, look, like. You see what I'm telling you, but you have no clue what I'm thinking. It's there's this wall, right? Like you have no clue like what I'm thinking about you. Or, and, and, and I don't know what you, like there's a distinction. And if, if there wasn't, it'd be a crime what we'd be thinking. You know, it could, could be criminal, right? To think certain things. Now, fortunately, it's just not criminal from a practical point of view. You can't get, you know, you can't be in, in prison just for thinking things. Well, there are people, think who, there, there are people who feel like they don't have privacy when they think, right? They feel like they're being watched, if not by other people, then by demons, for example. I mean, there are a lot of people who don't feel they're Yeah, so then that would be a case I, where um, where this thing wouldn't be relevant. But basically, um, that's a circumstance where they're in a different uh, framework. They're in a different shift of mode. This is saying, like, if you want to, maybe another way to say it is, like, this is what you need for participation which includes learning, so to speak. But like, if you want to participate, then you need to be playing with these three modes. A person who is so distraught that they can't, dis you know, that they, they don't, they're not allowed to make these distinctions. They're non-participatory, I would say. They're just simply not able to function as a participant. That would be my claim. Well, I think if you think your thoughts are being supervised, that doesn't forbid or paralyze you from participation. You can be highly participatory. It's just if you believe your thoughts are not private, I don't know exactly how it changes you. I'm just saying. Um, I think the people who push back when you tell them how it is are simply saying that's how it is for you and it works for you, but it is fluid and it's not like we all have to think like you to know the truth. That would be a horrible world, wouldn't it? If we all had to like become your students in order to have the truth. Well, let's, We'd want to live in that universe. Well, let's let's take it a step back. Um, one is uh, like in terms of clarity. So, like, if there was this not this privacy, like I believe you see God has access, let's say, to all. I think, right? Like, so I think that's uh, that's the way it is. I don't think that that's I think relevant. That's crazy. Pardon? 
you can think that I think that's, that's fine. crazy. I don't think a God has any time for me and what I think, and that that I just wouldn't go there. Well, God or not God, but there's an access, you know, you know, whether it's the universe or whatever, there's some kind of access to all my thoughts, let's say. It's not that's not the issue. Uh that that doesn't it's not an issue whether someone has access. The issue is like, you know, am I free to what am I free for? Like, what am I, what my freedom is all about? And I think that that stands. So, um, so to be able to um, have the clarity, you know, in a discussion like that to say, well, we disagree, right? Like, you know, so we need to be able to, if to have meaningful disagreement, you need to have some clarity, right? Otherwise, well, I, I don't know if it's disagreement. It's like, if I go to a cafeteria and I get these things on my plate and you get those things and we both have a satisfied meal, there was no disagreement because there was no objective that we all eat the same thing is what I'm saying. Well, there was no communication. Maybe that's what I'm. No, there was plenty of communication. I'm just saying between each because, other. I'm just saying clarity, no, but I'm just saying because clarity is my value, whether something's absolutely true or not, that could be interesting, but I value the fictional. I think that, People who live in a world of their own deserve my respect, like the Mormons, for example. I mean, you can go through life with a, what Rorty called a bag of beliefs on the side, and that's just your private freedom to have a bag of beliefs. And I don't need to go in there and prod and make sure yours conform to mine or whatever. So you, I could say, have a bag of beliefs that you also think are absolute truth. Well, that might be, maybe they are, but that's not of interest to me. I just want to get clear on what those beliefs are. That's it. Well, so what I'm saying is, first of all, like, uh, there's a huge step in terms of being able to get clear, right? Like, to, to even wanting to be clear. It could you take years. That's right? why we're all here. We're trying to get clear on your thing. Well, but just, just to say, um, uh, so first of all, there's that issue um you know what are we talking about like what is this person talking about like you know and and is there anything um is there any foundation to what they're talking about you know including me like is there what's the foundation so i'm trying like to for say me, that for me it needs to be useful in the long term and i'm getting a lot of value so it's useful to for me and i'm clear about that but it's not necessarily useful because it's absolutely true that's something you 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 waste your bandwidth on that question I don't care. Yeah, well, you don't have to be here either. So that's uh, like, you know, that's the. No, that's I'm the here to be clear. You got to value my value. You think no, that, no, oh, no, I don't have about to. absolute no. truth. You probably shouldn't be here. Well, it's that's like, what I'm trying to say. This is value. Like, you got to respect other values, right? Well, first of all, like you're the one who's insisting that I have to respect. Right. Where'd that come from? Yeah. Because you're a normal human being who has respect for others. Or, or are you? not? Well, what makes you think I'm a others? normal human being? What's the okay, evidence? Okay, so for you that? don't respect people who don't have the same values you do. No, well, I'm just, I just saying that. You're, to, you're, I just you're, needed to get clear on that. Thank you. No, I'm just saying you're picking a fight. First of all, that's your nature. But second of all, uh, you're critiquing me of the things that you are guilty of. I'm a mirror for you. I don't see any guilt here. There's no crime. We're just having a conversation, and yeah, I'm pushing. I don't say picking a fight. I'm just trying to like. Cut to the chase, see what's going on, and yeah. so I test you. Yeah, so that I'm seems a mirror. Like a, worthy, a worthy use of an hour. I'm a mirror. I'm a mirror, and the, very common. The criticism given to me is the criticism of the person themselves. I'm not. Being everything critical. you said here is pardon. I'm not criticizing you. I'm just getting clear that you know respect doesn't have to. I'm. You're like I admire very much Linus. Look, Storm. I was in a gang neighborhood. You know, I had neighbors. We had a conversation. It was about somebody, you know, with a knife, whatever. They, the guy said, "Look, it's all about respect." And I go, "No." I go, "You don't need to respect me." You don't right. need. As to I was going to say, I respect uh, Linus Torvalds. Who's Torvalds? He mm -hmm. lives here in Portland. But he says, "Yeah, respect has to be earned." And he I doesn't, don't, I doesn't have to have the concept of respect. Like, I will do my thing. You do your thing. If I respect you as a consequence, fine. Does that make well, sense? Well, we don't define what respect means. A lot of it just has to do with, you know, traffic signs. And, you know, that driver has as much right on the road as I do. So I have to stop if they got to the intersection first. You know, respect just means obedience to the norms of society in a lot of ways. Yeah, and so this is a society where I set the norms. I think that's the thing. 
And this is a community for investigating absolute truth. So if you don't want to ride on the road, you know, there's plenty of places you can ride. That's what I'm trying to say. I didn't, I'm getting confused. I think I'm getting confused. I'm investigating absolute truth for, to translate it for your benefit. Okay. That's what I'm here for. F fine. Whatever. I've, I've, I'm just I'll pushing. adapt my vocabulary. Uh huh. Okay. I'm lost where, why don't we reset? <laughs> where are we? Daniel, what's your, where do you want to go or what would you like to? What is the, we have two, three, four. We began by you describing that as A, B, and C. So mm -hmm. how many letters are in the alphabet total? Well, this is a metaphor, but the idea is that if you can understand, like the first things to understand is just simply A, B, C. Like you don't have to know how many letters are in the alphabet. It, it, different languages have different alphabets. But if they, you know, when they say the A, B, C's of Lithuanian, you know, we have 32 letters, right? The A, B, C's of English, they have 26, right? So the point being like, if you can't understand the ABCs, you're not really, you know, that's a good place to start. That's the point. Now, the idea, though, is that if you could understand the eight divisions of everything, then that would be a good place to go. If you could understand, okay, but these divisions, they have conceptions. So some of them have four conceptions. Some of them have two conceptions. You see, so there's six conceptions to deal with. If you could understand that, oh, but if you want to isolate an individual perspective, you'll need to work with the threesome and you'll need to take one of the four conceptions and then those will function as 12 circumstances, like backdrops for the imagination. So those 12 are good to know. And then I'd like to know about the languages. There's these languages that would, you know, then be the dynamic thing. So I've, I know one of them, I can maybe talk about that sometime, but there's like two more to figure out. Uh, then I think it's helpful to know I'll be making videos about these uh, eightfold structures. There's I talk I mentioned them in the overview of wondrous wisdom. So like for the needs and the the doubts and the expectations and the and the values. You see, it goes it goes on and on. Uh, a crucial basic building block is to understand from a theory point of view, like how does this all fit together? This equation of life that I call it. So um, because all of that is just documenting facts of the imagination. But then there's a theory, how are we gonna interpret this all? So the crucial one being this uh, equation of life saying that relating God and good and life is the fact that God is good, but eternal life is understanding God does not have to be good. And then understanding on four different levels, what does that look like? So there's a level of spirit, there's a level of structure, there's a level of conceptions, there's a level of unity, right? So those are some of the basics and I've made videos about them. But the, the point being, maybe to say, like, this is not about a bag of ideas. I think that was what was that the, was that the call? Like, because a bag of ideas suggests, oh, you have these little trinkets, you see. No, this is about uh, describing houses in the mind. You know, my mind has eight houses. Let's say in the, one one house has one room. One house has two rooms. One has, and when you're in that house, like it just seems like it's every, it's describing everything. Like so, there's these different ways of looking at it. There's these limits of the imagination. You could talk all you want, but you're using those limits. And I can appeal. So I would appeal to these uh, philosophy students. Say, look, you're doing this. You're making these distinctions in your actions pragmatically. The problem is, is that they kind of agree, but then they'd go on doing whatever they were doing before. You know, you can't. You can win the argument, but the argument makes no difference because they're not really participating in a certain sense. So the point is, is you know, that's why I said like, we need an activity, we need goals, whatever. Like, if we have things we care about to work on together, right? Then I can say, hey, see, this is real. But if it's just like, well, Kirby's here for his reason, Daniel's here for his reason, Jerry's here for his reason, I'm here for my reason. See, we have no basis for a shared reality. So there's not really going to be any kind of like uh, much, much progress made in this. But like when Kirby, you made those sketches and stuff, then I could say, well, look, this is I can describe what you're doing, you know, because you're participating. Same Jerry's done something similar like that. Then I can say. Well, I think we're we are trying to figure out what it is your models 
mean to you? And so it's kind of a collective interview where we try to draw you out to be more explicit because like 95% of what you said today about the twosome, I've never heard or read before. So I thank Jerry for asking you those questions, like what way does the arrow have to point? And what's the significance if it pointed the other way? If we took the arrow away, what would that mean? And you gave a long discursive answer that was all new to me. So I thought that was very useful. Yeah. And I think Jerry, Jerry has a better, more respectful way of asking you things. I tend to, like you say, I'm like those philosophy students you remember who don't, you don't like them very much and I don't have the right style. So I think I should let Jerry be the one to guide the discussion and I'll just listen. That's going to be my role. Well, that's not, you're not going to get very far, I think, like that. But the, one of the differences was like, the difference between you and them is like, I would go to them, I would go to anybody and say, hey, let's talk. They wouldn't go to me, you see. But you come to me. So you're not like them in that way. That's different. You're not a normal. I just, I just don't think I'm I'm the right diplomat to represent something. So I'll be more of an observer and less it's uh, your to try to interrogate. Because well, as just... a clarity guy, I'm an interrogator as a clarity guy. But you're an absolute truth guy. So you're much more, we're in this together. Let's all find the truth together. And I'm more like um, different contexts. So I think I just need to learn to uh i'll participate i'm interested but i don't need to force the issue let's say well you see i tend to force back <laughs> so that's the that's the i mean so it can go like that but not you know i, I here's a case where i respect you in terms of you know what do you think is uh there's many ways i respect you but like you know yeah make your make up your mind uh, but you don't have to have just one strategy you know you can play with different strategies just just maybe to kind of reapproach this i think fairly common sentiment if somebody expresses well there isn't an absolute truth there are multiple relative truths whether they're person specific or thing specific or moment specific would you say that that kind of a claim can only exist within a scenario where absolute truth exists like even to delineate what somebody would... Well, yeah, I would go pick apart that and say, look, you're saying somebody can have a truth. What does it mean to have a truth? And they're all having a truth in the universally similar way. I mean, according to exactly what you said, that's how I understood it. So why don't we just focus on that aspect? What does it mean to have a truth? You know, why is it your truth? You know, et cetera, let's just go from there. As opposed to taking it as a move to say like, back off and I don't have to treat you seriously. Like, I don't have to, I don't have to listen to you. So don't listen to me. Like, I'm going to find people who do want to listen to me. That's what I'm trying to say. Or yeah, not listen that's... to me, but like who wants to work, focus on that. I think that's more like, let's focus on the things that we could work out. As opposed to kind of like saying, you play there and I'll play here and I don't have to have anything, you know, we don't have anything in common, you know, unless on a deep level. Yes, it's like a glass half full, glass half empty. And mm -hmm. so people will look at a situation where there's partial overlap of semantics for example mm -hmm. and point to differences but as we kind of explored with the twosome to even point to to have to have slid to those things are different also it could have been highlighted the components that are similar right and before they were even evaluated as different in some way, they there was an ambiguity of whether they were the same or different in a way. So even to have resulted in an evaluation, like like we have different interpretations of a word, which for many people is is very rhetorically powerful mantra, absolute truth. That is actually like kind of already reflective of something that undermines their own expressed stance and so we're and so you can say that and i can re-say it and then like so re-saying say like in once you see those distinctions the higher energy one is the one that comes before you slide over the one with more in in belt ambiguity is the one that have more and so like if this is all kind of like 
in favor of ambiguity, like in favor of having a multi-track mind. So if you really want a multi-track mind, then you would talk about sameness because you have to think about difference also when you talk about sameness. But you just talk about difference, it's like you lose all the ambiguity. It's just all different. So, and the whole point of twosome is that you can think of same and different on the same thing. Like it's, you can think about like being and doing and thinking, you can think of them all. You don't have to choose one of them, but you just have to say, okay, but, we're talking about participation because we're talking about being, doing, thinking. So, you know, but now we can talk about knowledge, you know, whether, what, how, why, and we can shift it over. So one of the nice things was I was looking at um, Kirby, you know, saying, well, he doesn't quite understand me what I do. And they go, but Anders, look at what he's doing. And then to realize, oh, he's adding perspectives and saying, oh, these are the equations that I've been looking for. You know, like if you, you know, you can decide, do we agree? Do we not? Like, but it's in that process to say, oh, because he's going through these motions, he's showing it like we can start to connect. And Jer Jerry's done similar, you know, in John too. Like, what are you thinking about, Jerry? Well, I, <laughs> I've got a lot of new stuff to think about here today. I continue to be fascinated by your choice of symbolic representation and what this may or may not mean relative to me. Uh, so I intend to continue to pursue this and, and to continue to pound away at it to see if I can uh, get a better understanding in my mind of what you mean or, or what I think you mean. I think there's tremendous value and in, in interest. I really enjoy this process and I intend to, to stick with it and I will come up with more, more questions and examples and, and try to get to the, I, I'm a foundations guy. I like stuff that's really basic and simple. And so this becomes a real challenge. I, I see the symbols, they look really- uh, Well, they're similar in our case, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they resonate a lot with me. So how did you come up with those from a totally different background and approach than I did? And is there some kind of commonality meaning to all of this? I think there is. And I'm, I'm going to continue to, to pound away at it there. So I, I think it's it's fascinating and uh, we'll get there. I mean, th th these are things that we should be able to discuss and close in on. What are the differences and, and what right. do they mean? And so, but the crucial thing about the diagrams is that they're generally happening like last, like it's the last right. thing to worry about. And it's only right. to document and they could be wrong. Like, so like with the force and it's like, well, how do the arrows go? You know, that's a very sensitive thing. It's a subtle thing. It's not clear, obvious, like, um, so it's almost an aesthetic thing sometimes, but I think that there's a reality. It's just a matter of like really getting to, and if you go back to one of the early videos I did on preliminaries, like, uh, and if you watch that, you'll see, Hey, like, Andres did talk about all these things. I just couldn't, they couldn't register, you know, a lot of these things because, you know, now they may sound different. You go, he did talk about them. It's just that they kind of like passed through me. I didn't really. Oh, okay. Well, that's. Yeah, Jerry, thank you so much for making the, the undirected edge and the, the dual edge. Yeah. I mean, those, that's kind of like, it's like, how about, you know, um, the letter R with a little curly Q. And it's just like, it's like little typographical mm -hmm. variants, but it's like, well, no, you can't take an I and add a curl at the bottom. It's a different letter. You can't take an I and put a crossbar on top. It's a different letter. Um, It, it would make the word a typo. So like what? playing with that kind of like mm -hmm. syntactic adjacency where the semantics are like very latent or um difficult to grasp, kind of recomposing some of our graphical affordances, mm -hmm. which is also what I've seen in your um work. I mean, I think that's like that's sometimes uh more of an affordance for someone playing around than trying to throw darts into like a cloud. And it just feels like nothing grasped because it's like, why is this not that? But the whole point is we need to kind of like build up to understand the more latent semantics. And then when you said like, it's just like after the fact recording, made me think of, I mean, on the mm -hmm. screen, it's just the pheromone trace of the nestmate, mm -hmm. but whatever the nestmate leaves, isn't the nestmate's 
subjective experience. But there might be a pheromone trail that would reflect a kind of nestmate cognition. Mm -hmm. How do you, what, how, yeah, right. How do they do it, right? Like, so and just um, to bring up, like uh, in um, Jerry's writing, this notion of topologically invariant, you know, you use terms in your own way sometimes, but like, so you try to say like a, an O and a Q are different, you see. But in topology, they're the same. Like O, Q, and A, they are the same because they all have one hole. A B would be different because it has two holes. You see, an L and a dot would be the same because it's just, there's no hole. So there's, uh, you use the word in your own way. And so it becomes interesting. So what are you talking about? Like, so for you, a little stub has significance in a way that like in the branch of math, it doesn't. Uh, yeah, it's which is fine, different. which is fine. So one is just to be careful with terminology, but the other is just say, okay, but you actually mean something. What do you mean, right? right. Because you're, right. You've, you you have something to contribute, so. Yeah, it's the difference between the ball and the donut and the coffee cup and, and that kind of stuff. Um, I still think there's, there's some kind of, even though you talk about the diagrams are last, there still is some sort of reason that you chose the diagrams you did. Because I couldn't draw them any other way. That was the simplest yeah. way I could draw it. No, they could have been arbitrary. They could have been anything, but they weren't. They they were the diagram. Well, how do you draw a three cycle? It's it's what I'm saying is, is right. that I think there is, despite your saying that this is really kind of an afterthought, it's just a, an arbitrary. We could have called them A, B, C, D, E. We didn't need diagrams at all, but yet the diagrams are there. And the diagrams were really of interest to me. Well, and the crucial the crucial thing about like why I drew it, like the crucial decision to make was to say there's states of mind and there's shifts. There's nodes and there's arrows. And that's a very crucial distinction. And the arrows are real. They're real shifts. To say you experience them is probably wrong because it's not like you're, that. then they would be states. But you experience that you, you're in another, you know, you entered in another state. That's what you... That's something like that. Um, we have the hour complete, uh, Daniel. Um, in well, maybe maybe we've gone enough for today, but like final thoughts and maybe thoughts for next time or thoughts for tomorrow. All right, I look forward to our continuing discussions. Thank you. <laughs> Me too. Yes, I'm. I'm always struck by the the tension and the paradox, not necessarily to be resolved between conversation and dialogue. And the static or like transcendent nature of topics that are not just linearly threaded out through the mouth. Mm -hmm. And I find it very helpful that Jerry, uh, you know, I say leader, and I, I mean that way, like, the more you lead, the better it is, I think, like, you know, if you come up with a topic for next time, is that, uh, is okay. that, if, and I'll, if people I'll work if, on it, I'll, I'll continue. And you write us, right. Yeah, exactly. I'll continue to pound away because it, it's really very fascinating to me. It's what I want to do. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, we'll talk tomorrow. So a closing, who would give a closing uh, prayer? Uh, but Kirby, I just want to say you're very lovely and I, I'm <laughs> I'm very glad you're here with us. I mean, it means a lot. To... I, I predict we will have our little spats from time to time. <laughs> That's fine. Well, yeah. You, you're you're worthy yes <laughs> all part of the show um well then daniel would you close us with a prayer please thank you for all the before during and after of today may we know when topological changes and or geometric changes are apt Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. All right, ready? Give a gift to yourself. Sign up at Math for Wisdom. And then you can go to Patreon. It takes two minutes and become a supporter. Fantastic. <laughs>